Welcome to our symposium, Closing the Gap Between Research and Clinical Application, Neuroimaging Indicators of Brain Structure and Function. My name is Randy Golub, and I'm really happy to welcome you here today. I'm so glad you could join us. We're delighted that over the course of the day, we'll be welcoming participants from China, from Italy, from Germany, from England, Thailand, New Zealand, Denmark, Tunisia, the Netherlands, the Philippines, Spain, Israel, Canada, Belgium, Ireland, and across the US. It is only appropriate that I actually begin by saying, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I especially want to express my appreciation for the attendance for those of you for whom today is an auspicious day and wish us all a very happy, healthy, and prosperous new year of the ox. This event, as it was originally conceived, was to be held in person. The dark storm clouds of the COVID-19 pandemic have a little bit of a silver lining for us. Because we are gathering virtually, so many more of you can be here with us today to participate in the networking, the mentoring, and the learning sessions. A few quick tips to make the day the best it can be. Keep your web browser open, your window open to this symposium website, specifically this My Agenda page, and use the links there to join the sessions. You clearly knew how to use this to, because you're here with me now and will remain so with us through Dr. Eikhoff's lecture. If you run into any difficulties, you can use this help desk page to provide solutions. So now let's turn our attention to why we're here today. We have many good reasons to be focusing on this topic of neuroimaging indicators of brain structure and function, millions of them, in fact. Brain diseases, including depression, migraine disorders, dementias, and cerebrovascular diseases are the leading cause of global disability. And it's highly likely that either you yourself or someone you are close to suffers from a significant brain disorder. And that likelihood is steadily rising as we grapple with the consequences of this COVID-19 pandemic. As my colleague, Jonathan Rosan likes to put it, for many who suffer from serious brain disorders, their bodies survive far longer than their brains creating a tremendous burden on caregivers and society. Meeting that challenge head on is the mission of the McCant Center for Brain Health, one of the sponsors of today's symposium. We here at the McCant Center are working to reduce the incidence of brain disease around the world and the suffering that it causes. We do this in multiple ways. One of which is to identify and study indicators, for example, the structural and functional imaging metrics of brain health. We need these indicators to help discover and develop treatments to prevent brain disease and improve brain function. For example, being able to identify and quantify a positive impact of an improved diet or better sleep habits, more exercise, or that would make a brain more resilient to a disease can help motivate people to change their habits. We will know if we have been successful when we have catalyzed the integration of these indicators and interventions that we find, discover along the way into primary care so as to affect a meaningful impact on reducing brain disease. So we are here today because whether you are a researcher, a clinician or both, we share a commitment to speed the day when anyone with a brain-based disorder or reason to be concerned about having one will have the benefit of non-invasive imaging technologies to help them understand what is wrong. And if there is something wrong, to have the capability to monitor treatment. The goal of today's symposium is to focus on the gap between the many tremendous advances being made every day across the spectrum of clinical translational brain uh, research to better understand how the brain functions as well as it dysfunctions and what it will take to advance that knowledge to a point where it will positively impact clinical practice in a way that protects and preserves brain function. 
Let me illustrate with a, an example of the work that we'll be sharing with you today. For some brain-based disorders, brain imaging is already incorporated into the standard of care in many countries, such as for assessing hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy in newborn babies. Hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, or HIE, is, is a very common actual brain injury in babies who are born after full-term pregnancies. As treatments for the babies improve, more will survive, and many suffer from long-term deficits from the damage to their brain. Most of them, most of the babies will have a brain scan done sometime in the very early days of life, a brain MRI scan. And those scans include diffusion-weighted imaging sequences that are used to calculate the quantitative apparent diffusion coefficient or ADC value. And these maps are useful because they can reveal the extent, location, and severity of brain damage. And this information can be of great value to clinicians and families as they struggle to make difficult decisions. But it takes great skill and experience to read these scans, and even experts often interpret the scans in different ways. This was the gap that my, my friend and colleague, Dr. Ellen Grant, has been one of the many grants gaps that she's been working to fill in her career. Our former postdoc, Yang Ming Wu, now assistant professor of radiology at Boston Children's Hospital, will share some of the work that we have done to develop quantitative atlases based on carefully curated clinical scans of normative babies that are, can be used to distinguish healthy from diseased brain tissue. Dr. Wu is one of the speakers in track one opportunities and obstacles towards precision multimodal MRI. As another example, when an adolescent is brought to the emergency room severely depressed with suicidal thoughts, there's little we can do to rapidly reverse the disorder or to efficiently guide treatment decisions among the plethora of available options. How much better to have been able to accurately predict who is at risk for depression in the future and begin preventative care? That is just some of the exciting work and the vision of my friend and colleague, Dr. Susan Whitfield Gabrielli, that she'll be sharing with you today some early pilot and, and established work that, uh, that will happen during track two on our frontiers of clinical functional brain imaging. Also in that session, you'll hear from the most talented, Dr. Sean Siddiqui, about the ways he and his mentor, Michael Fox, are using functional connectivity measures to improve outcomes for depressed patients treated with transcranial magnetic stimulation. In all these examples, there is a truly exceptional integration of neuroimaging research, expertise, and clinical translation. The organizational structure of this symposium comes from our other sponsor, the Neuroimaging Training Program within the Harvard-MIT Health Sciences Technology Program. The NTP, as it is affectionately known, is now in its 16th year, and through it, we seek to train the next generation of leaders who will fill this gap and more. Our program supports our students who work through a, in anything that's related to neuroimaging across all scales, imaging modalities, and different, um, and, and different points along the process from image acquisition analysis uh, to, to the actual implementation in a hospital. Um, it work, our students work at all levels of scale and are incredibly ha passionate about the clinical translational of, of their work. In the most comp recent competing renewal application, we propose to host biennial symposia on topics relevant to the work of our trainees and with, had an explicit goal of fostering greater collaboration amongst them and our faculty. I can say safely that we have achieved that goal and more. I'm really proud to give a big shout out to Nalini Singh and Jordan Harrod, two of our students who will be presenting in some of the tracks today. And also to Sandia Subramanian and Mitchell uh, uh, Robinson, who you won't see, but who are behind the scenes helping to make the moderated discussions run smoothly. So I want to extend also my thanks to the many NTP faculty members who participated in today's event through planning, speaking, mentoring, both directly and indirectly through their support of one or another of the, uh, the NTP trainees who are working uh, on this project. 
I also want to thank all the many faculty who have contributed to make this day uh, and this symposium successful and hopefully useful for all. As you will hear, we have made much progress towards bridging this gap with movement towards standardization of imaging acquisitions and analysis workflows for brain imaging in the research and clinical domains. In today's talks, we will be able to cover but a mere fraction of all the important work being done. While no half day event could properly convey all the excitement of current advances nor the daunting challenges remaining to be overcome, by the end of the program, we hope that you will not you will have not only a greater appreciation for what is currently going on in this domain, but especially for all of you who are uh, still in the early years of your careers, a clearer focus on what you are most curious about and how you will contribute to closing this gap. We hope that the sampling serves to educate, motivate, and inspire you all to continue this crit critically important work. And now I can think of no one better to give more fitting, to give the keynote lecture for this symposium than my colleague, Professor Simon Eikhoff. Dr. Eikhoff is a physician scientist having studied both medicine and receiving his doctorate degree in neuroanatomy in the laboratory of the incomparable Carl Zillis of blessed memory. In his own words, Dr. Eikhoff never left that university and now he is the director of the Institute for Systems Neuroscience at the, at the Heine, at the Heinrich Heine University in Dusseldorf, Germany, and the director of the Institute of Neuroscience and Medicine at the Research Center Europe. He is an especially fitting speaker to begin this program as it is the topic near and dear to his heart and the focus of his award-winning research. Dr. Eikhoff, thank you so much for being here with us today. Okay, I hope both the video and the sound came on. It uh, started a little bit. Welcome also from my side. Good morning into the US. Good afternoon, good evening to the rest of the world. And thank you, Randy, for giving me the opportunity to present, um, I would say an overview, a teaser of what's going on for the rest of the day. Quantitative markers of brain health. I mean, this is a huge topic and I can not promise you that I will give you a full rundown of what is possible, what we're doing, what will be the future. But rather, um, I am particularly excited to give those that have not really been working on or following the idea of neuroimaging for individual diagnosis, individual prediction closely, somewhat of an overview of how to get into the field and what we can achieve with that. Now, one caveat, I'm actually controlling a screen that is in Boston and my internet connection is more okay than really great. So I'm kind of curious to see how well I can sync both my speaking and my clicking. And it starts with the clicking not really doing a lot. Okay, here we go. Oh, well, that's gonna be an interesting challenge. We are all different. If we would have our cameras on, we would be very straightforward reminded of that. We are of different ages, of different gender. We are obviously different in genetics, but importantly also when we talk about the topic of brain health, we're also very different in terms of experience, physical health, lifestyle, and so on. So there's a lot of factors that distinguish each of us from each other. And all of these factors, it's fair to say, do have some influence on brain neuroanatomy, and in particular also on structure, function, and connectivity, as we can measure it with in vivo non-invasive MRI techniques. And then taking it one level further, obviously these individual expressions of neuroanatomy, this individual structure, function, and connectivity shaped by all of the influences I was talking about. These are then the substrate for our inter-individual differences in any mental traits, from cognitive performance to socioaffective functions to ultimately psychopathology. <laughs> so the question is, how can we better get a better insight into the factors that drive 
variants in brain neuroanatomy, functional neuroanatomy on the one hand, and the downstream effects that are what we often care about. Oops, wait, what happened here now? Um, okay, um, I was actually seeing me big now, not the screen. Now, biomarker research, imaging biomarkers, that's not a new field. If you go to PubMed, you will find hundreds, thousands of paper, biomarkers for depression, biomarkers for dementia, biomarkers for all sorts of brain disorders. Now, the critical thing to remember here is that I would say almost all of the research, and certainly all of the research up to a few years ago, really followed a very standard approach, and that is within sample comparison or association, usually testing a null hypothesis that there's no difference between two groups, that there is no association with a certain target variable. And um, it, I guess most of you have seen, and uh, many of you have published figures as the one I'm showing here. I certainly have many times. So there is a significant difference in cognitive performance between patients and controls. And uh, if you look at the p-value, p less than 0 0.001, look at the standard error, that's quite an impressive effect. I mean, many times I would, I would be happy to be able to show something like this. Now, the big question is, would that be a good biomarker? Would that be a good biomarker for individual diagnosis of brain health? Now, let me show you the very same data, just in a more honest fashion. This is now not as summary statistics, but actually individual data points. And I think it becomes quite straightforward, quite clear from this view that indeed a single marker, even if highly significant, usually does not allow good inference at the individual level. And in fact, though usually what we have is not a single marker, but multiple of them. And um, already collecting a little bit of the slide to make sure I'm not uh, uh, slowed down by the technical aspects later. Um, usually what we find is something that is very similar to this toy example. You have several variables that all, they're not really significant, but there's some effect. So this is a toy example, basketball players and Zumo ringers. If you look at the height, there's no significant difference, but it's also not too bad. P 0.1. Maybe you just need more subjects. Same for the weight. And then also both features are highly correlated with each other. This, I think, is uh, to all of us who work in biomedical research, something that we are all too thoroughly familiar with. Lots of variables, kind of different between groups, and also highly intercorrelated. Now, the key aspect is that even in such situation, where you have no effect, no significant difference between groups on the individual variable level and a high intercorrelation between variables, the joint pattern can actually allow a very good individual distinction. Yeah, so that is a key aspect that really everybody needs to remember when we move from the classical group statistics into individual inference is that being significant doesn't mean it's predictive. And conversely, something that is not significant can in combination with other factors actually be highly discriminative even at the individual level. So how do we go about if our goal is to perform individual predictions, individual inference from neuroimaging? We need to start with large enough groups of subjects. Now, one of the key questions that immediately comes, what is large enough? Uh, the trivial answer is it's never large enough. You always want more uh, for the simple reason that the more subjects you have, the better you cover the actual underlying distribution of your features. But as a rough household number, anything below a couple hundred is probably not gonna be particularly reliable. The first and important step, and I highlight that because that's something that 
is often uh, receiving not the love, the attention it deserves, is fair data management and high performance computing. You cannot do these kind of advanced analysis methods if your data management consists of an Excel spreadsheet and cleverly named folders. At some point, sooner or later, maybe later, maybe when you get to 5,000, but certainly when you get to 50 or 100,000 subjects, that's going to fail you. You can use, then use this environment for standardized processing of the data. That in itself would be the topic of another uh, full length talk, how to make sure that you have a robust and reproducible data processing, including quality control and so on. But in the interest of time, we're gonna reduce our data to what will then really matter for the actual analysis. And that is usually you have a set of features and a particular target. Now, this is from the machine learning perspective, the actual way and the only way that your data looks like. So in, um, uh, along the, the rows, you have the different subjects. Along the columns, you have the different information. So for example here, this are regional volumes for several hundred different brain areas. And then you have a target variable that can be cognitive performance, that can be a clinical diagnosis, uh, whatever you need, whatever you like, I almost said. And remember the key objective of any machine learning, of any individual inference, is to find a mapping between the feature space and the target space. So how do you have to manipulate the features to arrive at the target? We obviously have a very broad toolbox in terms of available methods to perform this optimization of mapping. But then, and this is the critical aspect, whatever model you uh, obtain, you need to validate in new subjects. So you have your one cohort, you train the model, find the mapping between the brain features and the cognitive or clinical target you're interested in. And then you have a new group of subjects. For these subjects, you just take the brain features, little asterisk, obviously you need to make sure that all the processing has been done in the same way with the respective provenance tracking and so on. But in the end, for the new subjects, you have just the features, you give that to the algorithm and say, now do your magic, apply what you just have learned and give me the individual prediction for these new subjects. Here's a quite straightforward, I would have to say, exemplary case, aging and structural brain changes. Now look at the two brains shown here on the screen. Uh, they are both from the same study, same protocol, same scanner, and uh, yet they look quite different, right? I mean, if you look at the, on the left side, uh, you see very small, gyre, very uh, tight ventricular system. And if you look at the right, this looks quite a bit wider, everything really. There's less brain, more empty space. Now, the left brain is from a subject in the early 20s, the right one from a subject in the early 60s, I think. Now, there is no particular, let's say, revolutionary magic in seeing that. In fact, this is something that a radiologist uh, is usually writing down as the first part of their brain MRI report uh, that the brain looks either age equivalent or it looks, for example, pre-aged. It looks older, the psyche are wider than I would expect from a subject of a given age. But can we do that now in a completely automated quantitative approach? Uh, this is really just uh, filling in what I explained theoretically two slides ago. So you have a lot of brains, you do your automated pre-processing, uh, then you need some form usually of data reduction because, and that's uh, I think a, a critical, uh, a slight but critical mentioning. If you look at the brain as it is there, 
you see a brain, you see gyri, you see sulky, you see structures. The computer doesn't see a brain, doesn't see a shape. It really just sees 400,000 individual data points. And 400 data points is a lot. In fact, it makes the problem too high dimensional or rather the number of observations, the number of subjects you have relative to the number of features you con are considering is too low. So we usually do some form of feature reduction often by applying a priori knowledge on brain organization, brain atlases. So in this case, we had about 7,000 subjects, 600 features. And the question is, can we now predict individual age for a new subject, a subject that has not been part of the training set. And indeed we can do so quite well. If we look in healthy controlled subjects, now healthy just means not having a diagnosed neurological disorder. Then we get at a precision of about plus minus four years. So from a single 10 minute uh, T1 MRI scan, we can approximate age, uh, give or take at the level of about four years. But what's very interesting to see is that if we look at patients with neurodegenerative disorders, for example, Parkinson's, MCI, and in particular, Alzheimer, yeah, that's coming, uh, this is elevated quite a bit. So take the extreme case of an Alzheimer brain. If you have a brain of a 65 year old patient with Alzheimer's disease, then that brain actually looks like the brain of a 75 year old, so 10 years older. I'm sorry for the little breaks in between, that's why I'm always clicking. So here's an um, extension of the work I just showed, where we uh, addressed one problem that I think is critical when we're talking about bridging the gap. And that is not just bridging the gap between uh, research and translation, but it's also bursting the bubble. Bursting the bubble in the sense that uh, if you have thousands of scans from your high quality MGH machine, you can fit beautiful models on that. Now, will these models work also in a community hospital somewhere in rural Pennsylvania? The most likely answer is no. No, because there is a lot of idiosyncrasy to the actual data that in machine learning is known as batch effects. So how can we get around this? Uh, one way, and I think we're gonna hear something about this later in the talks is uh, data harmonization, either a priori or post hoc normalization. And the other way that we use here in this study is to actually uh, use variance in training. So we present the algorithm during training with a lot of different things from, in this case, the nine different cohorts. And there was uh, some stratification and some, some other small tricks in there. But end of the story is uh, the algorithm is learning an unbiased view on aging that is not dependent on the structure of the training data. And if we apply that now to a new cohort uh, that contains patients with MCI, Alzheimer and healthy controls, uh, we again see a similar picture as before. But that's the interesting thing. In this study, we also looked at the effect of uh, obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. So sleep disorder breathing is a major risk factor for cognitive decline and dementia. And our hypothesis would have been obviously that uh, patients with sleep disorder breathing uh, who are at higher risk for dementia or who are more advanced in dementia, they also show an elevated biological age. Now, if we look at healthy controls, so subjects that have not have MCI or dementia with and without sleep disorder breathing, uh, we somewhat to our surprise did not find a significant difference. If we look at patients with MCI, we replicate previous effects. So we, they have an advanced brain age by about four years, but again, no difference between the two groups. And interestingly, even on the Alzheimer's side, we don't see that. Why am I so excited about these results? Because ultimately the main finding was a null. 
because I think this study illustrates the way we need to crawl forward toward translation. We have a new idea, in this case, the optimization of multi-site learning. And we have a new question. Now, if you apply a new idea to a new question, you either get nice results or you get null results, and you don't really know, uh, is that because of the new method or is that because of the new question? So what we did here is to have a new approach and address both a well-established question, the advanced brain age from healthy controls to MCI to Alzheimer, and also a new one. And we could very well see that uh, this new approach that we're taking is very capable of replicating previous effects that we would expect, yet we see a null effect in something that we also hypothesize. And at least from my side, I'm a big proponent of null results. I think we have way too little in the current literature, which is actually wasting everybody's time and resources because over and over people will try things that many others have tried and well, you fail again. And you fail again because you couldn't read in the literature that this doesn't work to make things worse. There's also publication bias. There's the garden of forking paths. So you also get a lot of spurious effects in the literature. Okay, closing up the issue on brain age and, um, and structural MRI. Here's another example where we had uh, yet another group uh, coming from, from our center, the 1000 Brain Study. Uh, again, applied this sort of multi-site learning uh, found that we can, again, estimate individual age quite well. And now the question was, does individual brain age in a healthy cohort actually relate to cognitive status? Um, here for cognitive status, we use the Benton test, a quite classical neuropsych test. And um, the answer is yes, but. The answer is yet but, because yes, even when we control for a lot of confounding variables like age, gender, and so on, education, we do a, see a significant relationship between brain age deviation, so does the brain look older or younger than you are, and the Benton score. But as you can see by the R value, while this is highly robust, it is still a relatively weak effect. So one of the big challenges for bringing anything into actual practice is to minimize the variation, to get a better grasp on all the other things that are going on, all the confounds, to really isolate the process better that we are ultimately interested in. Uh, for the last couple of minutes, I'm switching gears a bit from structural imaging to functional imaging. Uh, I'm actually a big fan of functional MRI because it's so dynamic and so rich, even though, and I think it's worthwhile to re-highlight that uh, structural MRI does have its merits. It has its merits because it is simple, reliable, and applicable. Yet, if you see the kind of dynamics and uh, networks going up and down, as you can see in that slide, uh, it's hard not to think that there should be so much more into it, this should certainly allow also insights into individual reliability, into individual phenotypes that are not possible with structural MRI. Now, one of the big challenges we have when analyzing um, functional data, in particular resting state data, is that we are squaring our feature space. So assume that we have a 600 area parcellation, which is reasonably big, but not huge. Now, 600 areas or the mean volume for 600 areas, um, if you have, let's say 2,000, 5,000 subjects, you have a fairly decent feature to sample ratio. Now, if you extract the functional connectome, that gives you a 600 by 600 matrix. So we're actually all now at 36,000 features. Well, luckily it's only half of that because the matrix is symmetric, but still we end up with something like 18,000 features. So the same sample size that you had earlier is not good anymore. It's rather uh, somewhat tricky. 
Plus, you have one other problem that I think is severely underestimated in the field. If you do whole connectome based learning, that basically means that true or spurious effects from anywhere in the brain can influence your prediction. So one of the, uh, the ideas that we are proposing here is to actually not approach the brain as a black box. We do know a lot about it. In fact, there have been 20, 25 years of fMRI of functional imaging. There's 30, 40,000 papers uh, all revealing the neural correlates of whatever. So can we take this literature, consolidate it, and then use this as a priori knowledge about where to look, where to actually uh, focus, so to speak, our attention on. And this is an example of how such papillon would look. So you start from this very big literature, and let's say you're interested in working memory. Then you can extract hundreds, hundreds of papers that all report X, Y, Z coordinates for increased brain activity during working memory. And an illustration of that you can see on the right side. And if you then apply quantitative coordinate-based meta-analysis, we can tame the chaos and basically arrive at a rather conspicuous, rather focused map of these are the brain areas that are robustly across hundreds of papers, across thousands of subjects robustly activated when people do a working memory task. We can conceptualize these areas now as nodes of the working memory network, and then in individual resting state data, extract the network, the function specific connectome. So you really go all the way from a big literature, 25 years, hundreds of paradigms, thousands of subjects, onto a model that you can use somewhat like an essay to extract data from that one particular person you're interested in. Now, the big question is, does that matter? And I can show you some interesting insights here. So these are two different networks, a cognitive network and a social effective network. And now we can extract from the very same participants, two different connectomes. Yeah, so we had a group of uh, several hundred subjects. And for each of these subjects, we can extract two connectomes, the cognitive connectome and the social effective connectome. And then let's ask a straightforward question. Can we predict individual cognitive performance from these connectomes? Remind you, they are based on the same resting state acquisition. And it turns out we can actually do a quite nice prediction based on the cognitive network, whereas we can do basically no prediction at all from the social effective network, something that we also then replicated with other cognitive measures. So what does that mean? What this means is that we can actually take one image acquisition similar to drawing blood once and then have multiple essays into that same data that we can use to individually predict on the individual basis for new subjects. For example, cognitive phenotypes. And this I think is a, is a massive step forward because we are now kind of aligned with what you would know in traditional let's say laboratory medicine, uh, you don't take a whole range of acquisitions. You don't have 40 different blood samples you draw from a patient, but rather you take one acquisition and then you differentiate out on the analytic side. And if we do that, we can actually on the individual level, again, in a predictive manner in new subjects, actually tell a lot about a whole range of different phenotypes from cognitive performance, and that is usually where it works best, to be honest, to social effective skills, to uh, let's say depression, to various cognitive factors, and so on. And so this offers the perspective of doing an automated and objective 
one shot psychometry rather than having the subject take many individual tests, hours and hours in cognitive neuropsychology testing. You need one image of the brain and then you have several different essays into the data that consist of a network model and a machine learning algorithm behind that. And then from that one image acquisition, you can in an automated and objective fashion get a very multifaceted view of individual, let's keep individual brain health, cognitive performance, socioaffective functioning, really all sorts of mental traits. One slide that is uh, somewhat of a caveat, or somewhat of an outlook, depending on your perspective. Now I've talked a lot about predicting and how good we are. And it's, it's really important to, to remember that algorithms always optimize a loss function, such as correlation or mean error. And then we end usually up with something that is a statistically significant prediction. Um, although, to be honest, we have to be a little bit hesitant here. Even a correlation between true and predicted value of 0.7, which is give or take as good as we can get at the moment if we are fair. This only means that we explain about 50% of the variance. So what is going to be our goal? Is our goal to increase R to 0.8, 8, 5, 9? Well, first of all, I think that would be a very tough goal. In fact, I'm quite unsure whether we actually can ever get there. Maybe even more importantly though, is that really what we want? If you can predict, if you can read out the mini mental score, 0.12 um, points better, is that gonna change your treatment? Is that gonna change the life perspective? Or isn't that really following the wrong trail. So one of the thoughts I'm having more and more is that maybe it's not as important to get more and more precise in the predictions, optimize the loss function for a little bit higher correlation, a little bit mean, uh, less mean average error. But what's really, really important is to be robust because when we later talk about clinical translation, be it in the hospital or in the sense of preventive medicine, brain health checkups. We're not gonna be interested in this second decimal of prediction accuracy. Usually we want something like a traffic light system saying good, bad, or mm, somewhere in between. So the goal and that requires a whole new type of algorithms. The goal will not be to actually optimize the overall loss function, but rather to be sure we are robust. If you're in the green state, then it doesn't really matter how precise your prediction is in the, within the green range. What matters a lot more is if you get a prediction of green, whereas actually you're red or vice versa. So robustness rather than precision will be the main challenge moving forward. Moving forward, I would like to sum up what I've outlined. The basis of any quantitative markers of brain health will be large multi-site cohorts with a backbone of uh, very advanced data management and high throughput computing. We will need to, we will absolutely need to incorporate a priori knowledge on brain organization, because no matter how big your data, no matter how many uh, subjects you have, brain imaging data will always be more high dimensional. And what really matters in the end is to have a good feature to sample ratio. So we need to incorporate what we know about the brain for biological data compression. And then we will hopefully be able to move to this idea of machine learning for individual one-shot psychometry. But on the other hand, we also have 
a lot of non-imaging factors, in particular genomics and immunology. Immunology is particularly interesting because it uh, has both a uh, genetic and a lifestyle a history aspect. And then hopefully we get more mechanistic insight into the relationships, genes, brains, behavior. And I would really like to highlight that these are two independent goals. A good prediction doesn't need mechanistic insight and a mechanistic insight will not necessarily lead to good predictions. Ultimately, we want and we probably need both, but we should be clear for every single study that we conceive, that we do, that we publish on which of the two tracks is our main goal. With that, I would like to close by thanking everybody in our institute and thanking you for the attention. And I'm very much looking forward to the rest of the day discussing exciting research with you and participating in the mentoring session afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. What a wonderful talk. I, I can't imagine anyone doing a better job of introducing this material and sort of kicking us off and starting us on a good way. Um, many of the points that you raised and the issues that you, that you illuminated will be explored by our speakers coming up. Um, we do have a spare moment. And so uh, if people do have any questions that you would like to ask of Simon, if you put them in the question and answer box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, um, I will try to convey those, those to him. Um, I see there's one there now. Give me one second. Uh, you were asked, well, first you were said, thanks for the great talk. I totally agree. And asked, have you used data fusion algorithms to fuse information for all the different features extracted from the brain? Not to a large degree, to be honest. Um, so most of the work we are doing is either on the structural side. So as I briefly mentioned, I'm actually a big fan of structural MRI due to its simplicity and its applicability also in clinical situations or on resting state um, fMRI mainly because this sort of connects more with our background, our ideas of functional neuroanatomy. Uh, that being said, it remains to be seen whether fusing different modalities, let's say structure MRI, function MRI, diffusion, uh, does give a, better um, give a better prediction. My personal take is that uh, likely if we actually combine that on the feature level, we are probably gonna make our life harder rather than easier because the big struggle that we have and the issue that we use a lot of energy to reduce is feature to sample ratio. So for each modality individually, we already don't feel comfortable with the number of subjects we have relative to the number of features. So if you fuse, fuse at the feature level, that is only making this problem worse. My personal idea perspective is that likely we're gonna see a fusion later on the model level so that you have some form of stacked modeling that then allows you to get a better precision. Also, though a small word of caveat beyond feature to sample ratio on multi data fusion is that it needs to be stay practical. So my vision is always to come up with something that will work in the community hospital settings, that will work in radiological practices that do not need the full machinery of, let's say, the HCP um, scanner protocol with all the advanced uh, MRIs, with all the task protocols, the high-end multi-shell diffusion, and so on. So I rather have simple data that is actually attainable in a lot of different situations than better data that nobody can, uh, can get really in practice. That is a perfect segue to the next question. <laughs> so and Simon- I haven't even seen it. Yeah, yeah, I know. So that's like, ah, oh, somebody helped us here. Uh, so the next question that came in was, can you please address correcting for scanner differences 
when working on those big multi-center data sites. And I'm happy to let the, the questionnaire know that there will be a lot of detail on that in the coming questions, but I'll let Simon have first stab. I uh, briefly alluded to that already. Um, there are three fundamental ways. There's a priori harmonization, having a shared protocol. Uh, that is something that I feel will not get us very far. Why? Because it uh, limits us to who are the ultimate users of our, of our tools, of our algorithms. The second approach is post hoc normalization or post hoc harmonization. And I think that uh, is an extremely exciting perspective. In particular, if we can get away with a somewhat limited calibration sample for each new site. Uh, the last approach, which I'm very keen of, is to actually work on the heterogeneity at the level of modeling. So um, that we, from the outset, train models that are generalizable also across sites, even if that means that the performance estimates we get are worse than what we would get from a model that stays sort of within site or within sites. And I think that there's a lot of very exciting uh, ways to go forward there. I mean, briefly alluded to the uh, particular uh, stratified ensembles can provide quite an interesting perspective, but um, there's a lot more work that needs to be done on these issues. Great, great answer. Thank you. We have time for just another question or two. Um, here's the next one. When doing feature reduction based on prior fMRI literature, how do you deal with the high rate of false positives that seem to plague fMRI research? Ooh, we've got a skeptic here. Is that a challenge yep. in making your, your approach robust? I'm, I know what you're gonna say and I'm so excited to hear you say it. <laughs> yeah, um, if the literature is big enough, it's good. So the key assumption, well, with a small asterisk on top of it. And the small asterisk is if we assume that the false positives are give or take randomly distributed, and the literature is big enough, then meta-analyses are the golden path, the avenue to the promised land. Because if you then pool across dozens, hundreds of experiments using different paradigms, different subjects, different analyses, tools, and so on, uh, then what you would end up with is what is robust, what is true, although I don't like the word too much. But I'm also very aware of the asterisks. The problem is if there's a systematic bias in the field. Let's say for a certain paradigm, everybody expects the amygdala because of theoretical reasoning. And so people will try and massage their data until they find the amygdala in whatever crooked way they do that. Um, removing outliers, testing a few different other ways to model the responses and so on. And finally, you get that one spot in the amygdala. Now we can publish. If this happens, then this is a problem. But honestly, if that happens, nothing can save us. Um, but as long as we assume that there is a more or less random distribution of noise, of spurious findings, we are good. And what helps us is the cost of fMRI. Because fMRI is so expensive, and there are so many journals out there, virtually any study gets published in the end. So there is a relatively small file draw effect in fMRI relative to experimental psychology. Once you spend your $10,000, $20,000 on scan costs, you need a paper to come out. And there's enough journals so that every, almost every fMRI study does actually come out in the end, which is great for us because it means we get a fairly, fairly unbiased literature. And then the summary of that will give us a robust estimate for where we need to look. Excellent. And I, I will also point out the field is really working hard towards reproducible and replication and doing things to try to minimize that effect. But we do have bad press out there for some of the stuff as well. Um, we have a couple more these great questions. Uh, so the next one, increasing research on large sample sizes is suggesting that the field has been overestimating effect sizes. 
Do you have any thoughts or suggestions on how to interpret these really small effect sizes and where to set thresholds? Okay, um, let me start with, I don't care about effect sizes. What I really care and what you should care in the context particular of the current today's symposium is generalization. I don't care how big the effect is. I care about how good, how robust can I tell something in a new subject, not the within sample effect sizes, the generalization to new subjects. And here, there is no threshold. There is no fixed level that we need to achieve. Uh, of course, it would be great for a diagnostic test to have like 99% uh, accuracy, 99% sensitivity and specificity. Yeah, sure, it would be perfect. Um, but if we have 80%, 75%, yeah, we're not going to be excited about that. But it's not going to be a Tesla autopilot anyways. It's always going to be seen together with a physical examination with a blood test, with a structured interview by a physician. And so I think what we need to is to have robust evidence with a good quantification of generalization. And if we come and end up with a really highly precise, perfect test, great. If we end up with let's say 70, 75, 80% accuracy, that can still be a very, very valuable contribution to the actual ultimate clinical decision-making, but it's just a contribution. It's not an autopilot. Okay, this is awesome. Simon, I've got one more question, but I can't ask, ask you now because we got to get people to the chat. Okay. So I'm going to cut. So that last question is awesome. I'm going to write it down and I'm going to ask you afterwards and I'm going to tell the answer in the state of the field uh, session that will close uh, us up. Uh, if you could please put up the closing slide for this with the instructions for folks. I just want to thank you, Simon, for what was an absolutely perfect kickoff to today's event. Thank you. I want to welcome everybody to get up, stretch your legs, and then quickly come back and meet with us uh, in your tracks, track one or two, whichever you've signed up for, and uh, continue with this day. Thank you so much. It was wonderful having you all for this talk, and it'd be great to keep. Maybe I can off. just. Yeah, okay, thank you. Well, go ahead, Simon. What do you want to say? Well, I just saw Max Owen's question here. I think that's super relevant. Um, if Do we need MRI to predict if uh, other demographic and psychological variables are better? The promise here is that fMRI can tell you something about degeneration that is not phenotypically visible yet. So it may tell you something that you can only test in two years. It's a promise, though. It's not what I can demonstrate. Okay, Simon, you got it. All right, everybody, pop off of here, pop onto your other Zoom link. We'll see you in your tracks. Thank you.